I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Why'd you kill the woman? I wanted to. So why don't you kill me? In due time. Welcome back to Sylvester Stallone Revisited. So, picking things up in the year 1979, and after the mammoth success of Rocky II, Sylvester Stallone's star was solidified, and next he picked the 80s, yet feels like the 70s action thriller Nighthawks as his next project. So, why did he choose that film? Well, he said the material resonated with him, and that's good enough for me. So what's it all about? You got Stallone pimping in a Serpico beard, a badass leather jacket, and at his most epic when it comes to his killer thousand yard stare that he's used so many times in classics like First Blood, Cobra, etc. What else does one really need to know? Episode done, thank you for watching. Just kidding. Start trouble, okay? Why are you always in trouble, man? Nighthawks is about two cops named Deke De Silva and Matthew Fox, and no, not the guy from Lost. It's insane, it's impossible. And they're played by Sylvester Stallone and of course, Billy D. Williams, the coolest of the cool. I don't claim you can have a better time with Colt 45 than without it, but why take chances? And the two of them are on the hunt for Wolfgar, a bomb-happy international terrorist played by the late and great Dutch actor Rutger Hauer in his first American role. So you got Stallone, Billy D, and Rutger Hauer. I mean, that is a trio not to be tangled with. It's a gritty, old school, and fairly engaging flick from start to finish. A visceral game of cat and mouse, if you will. Two men on opposite sides of the law, on a collision course. Taking into account its sordid production history, it's kind of a miracle this movie came out as well as it did. So let's dive right in. The screenplay is by David Schaber, and was first supposed to be for The French Connection Part 3. Gene Hackman's Popeye Doyle was to have a new partner, and they had Richard Pryor, of all people, in mind to play him. So guess who Billy D. Williams replaced in the finished film? His performance was probably a little bit more serious than Richard Pryor's would have been. I'm gonna pay for every life you wasted on this shit, motherfucker! When Gene Hackman finally said no dice on going down Popeye Doyle Lane once again, that was all for that. All the best, love and kisses. So Universal Pictures acquired the rights to the storyline and the script was rewritten to shave off all the French Connection references. Production began under the rule of director Gary Nelson, who had done the Disney films Freaky Friday and best movie you never saw entry, The Black Hole. Yeah, I know, that's, that's kind of a weird choice for a down and dirty action thriller, isn't it? Well, suffice to say, Gary Nelson didn't last too long on the show his ass was shit-canned after just one week of production. Why? Nobody really knows. But they went with an even odder pick to replace him, a very green director named Bruce Malmuth. Why would the studio bring in some dude with just one film under his belt? The 1975 film Four Play, and a comedy. This is just beyond me, but I have a theory. He was kind of a puppet director for Sylvester Stallone. This is something that Stallone has occasionally done in his career, where Stallone has directed a movie in all but the official credits. I think there's quite a few of his films in this filmography that you could say are technically Sylvester Stallone films, even though other credits are directed. There are so many moments in this film that have Stallone's fingerprints all over them in terms of his visual style, as seen in his later directorial efforts. The man was a megastar after the first two Rocky movies. Do you really think he was gonna let Gary Nelson tell him what to do? Come on, badass. Come on. I really doubt it. I mean, he's Stallone. So here's a quote from Sly, which he said at the London Palladium in 2014 that kind of supports our hunch that the success of Rocky actually made him insufferable and that he thought he had authority on everything and admitted I abused my power badly. So I think, unfortunately, Gary Nelson may have been a victim of that power. So I might just be talking over my ass here, but I think I'm probably right. In fact, I think you can watch a whole lot of Stallone movies, including probably even The Last Rambo, Last Blood, and feel that it's kind of pure Sylvester Stallone, right? But hey, that's for another episode. So for some reason, they got Bruce Malmuth, and for some reason, he couldn't make the first day of shooting, hence Stallone took over and directed the exciting subway chase sequence. And this caused some problems with the Directors Guild of America, 
as one of the rules that's not interesting enough for me to get into, but at the end of the day, they gave Stallone a pass and all was well in Graceland. Malmuth eventually got there and off to the races they went. I actually heard that there was quite a lot of conflict between Stallone and Rutger Howard during the shoot. Word has it that a stunt that saw Rooker pulled backwards by a cable to simulate being shot while the cable was yanked so hard that it strained his back. <laughs> And when Rooker learned that it was Stallone that gave the work to have the cable pulled that hard, supporting my theory that Stallone may have been directing, the feud began. Gossip aside, Stallone addressed the film in a 1993 interview and took the time to give Rutger some well-earned props. The film was a little bit ahead of its time in that it was dealing with urban terrorism. Now with the World Trade Center, it's happening. At the time, people couldn't relate to it and the studio didn't believe in it. Rutger Hauer's performance held it together and he was an excellent film. So, Regardless of any problems that they had on the set, it's all love, baby. It's all love. And one aspect of the film that I particularly enjoyed was its thrilling action scenes and its tense practical stunts. I mean, there's an epic chase scene that starts at a nightclub where they're playing Rolling Stone's Brown Sugar and goes out through a construction site. And then they zoom through a subway tunnel and end on a freaking moving train car. And it's simply sublime. That is one hell of a well shot and slickly edited action set piece. Stunt wise, maybe it's because all I see is CGI these days, which diminishes the sense of danger, but nothing hits my spot like witnessing a real explosion in a film. They just pack so much more punch than that CGI shit. The stunt highlight though is the part that saw Sloan being winched up the Roosevelt Island tramway cable car. It seriously had me chewing my kibbles and bits. The scene was even tenser due to the fact that it was so obviously Stallone doing the actual stunt. And that's not bad for a guy with a mortal fear of heights, something he would face once again down the road when making cliffhanger. But again, that's for another episode. Stallone had this to say to Ain't It Cool News about his man dance with the cable car sequence. Hanging from the cable car was probably one of the most dangerous stunts I was asked to perform because it was untested and I was asked to hold a folding Gerber knife in my hand so that if the cable were to snap and I survived the 230 foot fall into the East River with its ice cold 8 mile an hour current, I could potentially cut myself free from the harness because the cable, when stretched out, weighed more than 300 pounds. I tell you this because it's so stupid to believe that I would survive hitting the water, so to go even beyond that is absurd. I mean, Stallone man has got some balls, gotta respect it because you wouldn't get me doing that stunt. After the shoot, post-production kicked in and it echoed the filming in terms of chaos. The original cut of the movie was almost two and a half hours long and loads of violence was cut out by the MPAA. And the studio shaved the film down to a lean one hour and 39 minutes as they wanted a pretty fast paced film. It should be said though that Stallone had a hand in re-editing the film, and yes, the man as I said was all over this one. Sadly, lots of character development was lost, mostly having to do with our two leads, Deacon Wolfgar, plus the women in the film. The talented Lindsay Wagner, who was actually the bionic woman at the time, and Persis Combatant. And, do you recognize Persis Combatant? Remember the bald girl in Star Trek The Motion Picture, Ilea? Yeah, that's Persis Combatant with hair. She died a few years ago. I love Persis Combatant in this movie. Wagner's role in particular though got axed in the cutting room with her playing Deke's estranged lover and it's diminished so badly that I think it actually really hurts the film. As it is, she's basically a cameo. They make a big deal about her character, but you see her once and then never again. It's a shame that there's not an uncut version of the film out there because I'd love to tackle it. The wacky editing in the film is especially notable during the big climax where Stallone is pumping lead into Wolfgar and the cutting is so strange because apparently the ending out taxi drivered Scorsese in terms of being ultra violent. Yes, Stallone was having his taxi driver moment and apparently it was a gory bloodbath. But alas, it's been lost to time. I know that a lot of DVD companies have tried to find the missing footage, but they never could. So how is the final product? I think it plays remarkably well, but there are some elements of the film that are a touch dated and don't really work. For one thing, the Keith Emerson score is on and off. Sometimes it's really good and sometimes it's really bad, but I think the drastic recutting of the film did not help at all in this respect. <laughs> I got a couple of unintentional laughs watching this movie. For instance, a bearded Wolfgar is supposed to be getting a facelift, but he comes out looking like kind of a shaved Rutger Hauer, right? So I guess that's all the plastic surgeon did, shaved off his beard. I mean, that makes you laugh. 
I also find it kind of funny the scenes where they're cutting back and forth between Wolfgar planning terrorist attacks and hit in New York and the cops sitting through what had to be one of the longest anti-terrorist slideshows ever created by man. Try to stay with me, everybody. One that was filled with useless information at that. It went on for days and days and days, or so it seemed. Something to add, Vasula? It means we can't catch him if we're sitting in here. Guys, there's a psycho out there blowing shit up. Get out of there. Go to work. Finally, to say the plot turns were predictable by today's standards would be a bit of an understatement. You can't help but see it all coming. On that, though, the film is pretty gripping from beginning to end. Sloan is at his most intense, and the chemistry he shares with Billy D. Williams is simply excellent. You know when that bus gets to the airport, he's going to waste you. Why are you always trying to cheer me up? I wish Billy D. Williams had been in the film more, but the two of them really seem to be comfortable together and unbelievable as cops. Many of the set pieces have been engraved in my feeble mind since I first saw the movie, and that's a pretty good sign. There's the cable car scene, the extended chase, and the nightclub scene, which depending on the version you see, either has phony music that was replaced on home video, or has a bunch of hit songs like Brown Sugar by the Rolling Stones. Back in the day, Universal didn't always lock down their music rights, so home video versions of the movies would often feature different soundtracks. Nighthawks was one of those films. Oh, and of course, you also have Stallone in drag, not once, but twice. And Stallone, wow, doesn't he look beautiful in a blonde wig, complete with a beard. Also, you can't go wrong with Old New York as a location for a grimy cop flick. There's just some bleak charm and energy that no green screen work can capture. I mean, you feel like Sly and the rest of the cast must have been hitting Studio 54 after they called raps, right? New York. Where else? Plus, there's all kinds of really cool character actors in this film, including Joe Spinell, who showed up in a lot of Stallone movies at the time, and Nigel Davenport as the British cop who's teaching them all about Wolfgar. If you see something kind of peculiar in Nigel Davenport's stare, it's the fact that he only had one eye. One of them was glass. Shaka. Overall, the film was a fairly modest financial success. It only cost $5 million to make, but it grossed $14.9 million in North America and another $5 million abroad. The critical reaction to this movie was actually pretty good. And what they're actually doing with the movie now is apparently remaking it as a limited series. Yes, we recently broke the story on JoeBlow.com that yes, indeed, they are making a Nighthawks limited series, eight episodes, and that Frank Grillo is going to be playing Deke De Silva, and that Stallone would be directing all the episodes and would also be in it. Now, I don't know who he's playing. It'd be really cool if he played Wolfgar, but I don't think Stallone's going to go down that road. So Nighthawks, in the end, gets about 7 out of 10 Stallones from yours truly, and I really recommend you give it a look. It's definitely one of Stallone's more obscure films, especially from that weird period between Rocky II and Rocky III, where, you know, he was doing lots of strange movies like playing soccer in Victory. I really like this one. I think it's kind of a lost classic to some extent. So check it out. You could find it on Blu-ray from Shout Factory in a pretty nice remaster. If you like Sylvester Stallone Revisited, make sure to click the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support. Get him! You wanna kill that son of a bitch? Get him! Come on. You're fucking dead! You're killing motherfucker! You're fucking dead!